Well, amen. He is worthy of our praise, isn't he? All of our attention, all of our affection, all of our focus, he is worthy. Turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1, where we are going to be picking up in our series on every spiritual blessing. Okay, hopefully you've been uh, lugging this around and doing your uh, homework and kind of meditation, working on these verses. Uh, If you have no clue what I'm talking about, it is okay. We're in the middle of a series where we're walking through Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14, and we're unfolding how Paul says we have every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus, okay? If you don't have one of these and you are here, if you just lift up your hand, we'll have some ushers at the back who would love to come around and give you a copy of one of these. If you are tuning in online, there's a a, a download tab uh, right there attached to the sermon. Uh, We want you to take notes. We want you to be able to to focus and just kind of zero in on where we are, okay? And so as we've been walking through every spiritual blessing, there have been six blessings that we're moving towards. And we have covered the first three, okay? And those first three are that you are chosen in Christ, that God has placed you in Christ. And because you are in Christ, you have been chosen from the foundation of the world, okay? That you have been adopted as sons and daughters and that in Christ you have been redeemed. We looked at the technical term redemption, that it means being purchased, a ransom price being paid, that you have been purchased out of slavery into freedom. And that those three things constitute your identity in Christ, okay? The forgiveness, the redemption that you are in Christ. And then last week, We stopped, we hit the pause button, and we uh, talked about who's your one. We talked about the fact that God has someone in your life that you need to be praying for, that you need to be um, thinking about, that you need to be asking, do they know Jesus? And we committed last week as a church family for four weeks to pray for our one. Every day at one o'clock for one minute. I hope you've set your phone and that alarm goes off and it just happens to be, it's always a surprise. The first, first couple of times it was, what is that noise? What's going on? But I pray that it's been uh, powerful and moving for you to Uh, to continue to think about who is your one that the Lord wants you to pray for. Now, listen to me. Those first three, all right, that, that you've been chosen, that you are adopted, that you are redeemed, they work together as your identity. But in the every spiritual blessing, those are building. They're building blocks that are moving towards really where today is kind of a climactic moment in this one really long sentence that Paul has been unfolding, okay? And today, Paul is gonna explain to us how in Christ, because of our identity, we now have purpose. You and I have a purpose that is everything that our hearts long for. So listen, as we read Ephesians chapter one, I'm gonna start in verse three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. All right, and so I I don't wanna say too much in this one really long sentence. So verses four through eight, he says that we've been chosen, that we've been adopted, that we've been redeemed. Now look, follow along either on the screen or in your book because a lot of versions have a lot of different texts with this. If you're at home, follow along on the screen because I want to, as I read it, I want to explain it because Paul gets quite wordy here, all right? So here we go. In all wisdom and insight, He has made known to us the mystery of his will. So the fourth blessing is that he has now revealed to us, it has been made known, 
His will, which was previously a mystery, His will, according to His good pleasure with which He has set forth in us. So in your mind, kind of put that aside. We, we had spent a whole sermon on all of the glory that unfolds out of this. So His will regarding His plan of the fullness of times. What is His will? What is His plan? Here you go to bring all things together in Christ, things in the heavens and things on earth. So the fourth, every spiritual blessing is that what has been revealed, made known to you is his unfolding plan. And what is his unfolding plan? To bring all things together in Christ. Will you pray with me? Our heavenly Father, as we come to your word, as we press into you, as we turn our attention, our focus, as we try with with all of our mind, with all of our heart, with all of our strength, God, we need to hear from you. We need you to press into us through the power of your word, through your Holy Spirit, as only you can. Allow us to see you, Jesus, high and lifted up on your throne and that all things, all things find their meaning in you. We pray that in Jesus' name, amen. In 1905, the game of football was at a crisis moment. So much so that the president of the United States, Teddy Roosevelt, had to step in to save the game from being banned. Now, you have to remember, when the game of football began, there were no helmets, no shoulder pads, and not even the forward pass at that time. It was three downs to go five yards. And Everyone was in what they called the wedge formation. And they had actually invented this play called the flying wedge. The line lined up like this. They handed the ball off to the running back and then they picked him up and threw him over the line because three downs to get five yards. Okay, they, no helmet, no shoulder pad, threw him over the line. Well, you know what the defense decided to do to stop this play? They had a linebacker on their side that they picked up and they threw and they were supposed to meet and crash in the air. In 1905 alone, in that year, there were 19 deaths due to football. One paralyzed, one eyes gouged out, two skull fractures, 11 broken ribs, not to mention all the jaws and arms and nose and fingers that were broken. The game was so violent, Roosevelt stepped in, formed the NCAA in order to save the game. Now pause for a second here. From 1901 to 1905, okay, a five-year period of time that they were playing a ball game there were more than 68 deaths of young college students. Why? Just to get a ball over a line? You may initially think, well, it's just, they're just being macho. Young men with a sense of adventure. Maybe they're trying to impress the ladies. But it's even deeper than that. One word, purpose. You see, football was invented right after the Civil War and young men had died fighting for a cause that they believed in. You see, that inevitable need for purpose, it never, ju- it never disappears. It just transfers even to a game about getting a ball over a line. Every one of us in here wrestles with the deep questions of our heart, does my life matter? Does my life matter? And the reason for that is because God has hardwired you for purpose. 
Atheists will say, just, just ignore it and embrace the fact that there's no meaning in life. No. No, you can't do that, for as C.S. Lewis says, if you find within yourself a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, then it is most probable explanation that you were made for another world. God has made you in his image and placed eternity in your heart. Saying that we are made for purpose, is, is, it's just like saying that dolphins like to swim or that eagles soar on the wind. There is an inevitable, inescapable reality that your heart longs for meaning. God created you to invent, to engineer, to sing, to cultivate, to add beauty and value and meaning to life. All the while reflecting the glory of God, just like the way that the sun reflects the light from the sun, uh, the moon reflects the light from the sun. But sin darkened that purpose. It broke fellowship with God and it left you and I confused and looking for purpose in all the wrong places. Jeremy Bentham, the English philosopher and father of utilitarianism, at the end of his life, he deeded his estate to the college hospital in London. Underneath this condition, that they preserve his body, that they dress him up, and that they bring him to hospital board meetings and pronounce, Jeremy Bentham is here, he is present, but he is not voting. Looking for love in all the wrong places. Looking for love in too many faces. I think it's quite clear Jeremy Bentham was looking for purpose in all the wrong places. But truth be told, we don't have to look very far, do we? At a culture who's looking for purpose in all the wrong places. A prominent preacher once taught and gave the acronym for purpose idols. And it was so good, and I think it's worthwhile that I'm gonna share that with you this morning. Using the word idol and talking about ways that you and I struggle to find our purpose in all the wrong things, to define purpose the way that the world defines purpose. The I stands for items. We live in a world that screams, what you own projects who you are that your life would be filled with joy, such overflowing joy if just you had a horse on your shirt. Or that car screams, you're a leader. You're somebody. This phone, that neighborhood. Guys, if we're honest, consumerism is America's religion. You see, we buy things that we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't know. I remember in third grade, uh, a popular shoe kind of rose up and it was the Adidas Samba. And Adidas had three stripes on the side. It was a black shoe with three stripes on the side and it was all the rage and everyone had to have one. And as you can understand, uh, the knockoff brands began to pop up, but those shoes had four stripes. And one day my mom came home with a pair of four stripe shoes. I wouldn't be caught dead in four stripes. Can you believe that? And I told her, no way, I would be laughed out of school. You see, in so many ways, it's absolutely ridiculous the way that the image that we buy into the status, prestige, the meaning that we assign to material possessions. Contemplate this with me. Everything you own will find its way into a junkyard. Everything will ultimately end up in a junkyard. Moss and rust. Your phone will be obsolete by the time this sermon is through. 
In the end, Pharaoh tried to keep all of his gold, but it only went to grave robbers. The next place that we look for purpose in our life is in, D stands for duties. Your work, your tasks, what you are good at. I'm an engineer who works hard to provide for my family. I am my utility. As I mentioned before, that God created you to engineer, to invent, to cultivate, to add beauty and value to life. But there is a subtle line, guys, that is crossed in our hearts when our jobs start to become our identity, our ultimate source of purpose. Men greatly struggle with making their careers their defining moment. You see, the first problem with that is that your job and, you, and your utility are only for a season. Eventually, your health fades, the job market changes, and the kids move out. My father was a computer programmer until the industry passed him by. You remember the, the athlete who peaked in high school. He was the captain of the football team. Then he spends the rest of his life forever over remembering the glory days, trying to go back to when he was somebody, whenever he could throw a football over that mountain. You see, but if your ultimate purpose is found in your job, it's found in what you're good at, it's found in your utility value, eventually it all fades. Seasons change and life marches on. And who are you then? Secondly, you must see the blinding pride that swells when we are what we do. Forever comparing yourself against the next guy, always trying to push them down so that you can be just a head taller, so that you can be somebody. Nimrod was a great hunter and warrior king who had visions of grandeur. And God had told them after the flood to fill the earth and to subdue it, but Nimrod was driven by his own sense of power and purpose. And so Genesis 11 records how he gathers everyone together to make a tower, a tower that reaches to the heavens, and then he will be somebody. All will call upon his name. We don't have to look too far, do we? To look into our culture to see those who are so driven if their name could just be in lights. O stands for others. God made us for family, for friendship, for relationship. This is why the harshest punishment upon criminals is solitary confinement. But listen to me, anytime a good thing becomes a God thing, it's destructive. If your purpose and meaning in life is found in other people, sooner or later they will crumble under the weight of that strain. It's clearly obvious when we all look at the 13-year-old girl who can't function without that boy. She gets that boyfriend and she calls him all the time, she texts him all the time when they're around her, she's clinging to him all until they break up and then she's moved right on to the next life raft. Now I know you're far too sophisticated for that. We've grown out of all of that. Instead we become fathers who live vicariously through our son's sports or over-involved helicopter mothers. The truth of the matter is, is no relationship can withstain, can fill the void that only Jesus Christ was made to fill. There's a God-sized hole in your heart and only Jesus can fill it. And you can cram others in there, but they will ultimately feel that you are demanding, smothering, or needy. L is for longings. It is the statement that I will be content. I will find my purpose once that happens. 
Sure, I'm discontent now, but once I achieve, once I get, then that will fix everything. That's my purpose. Always one or two steps away. I remember when I was young, you, you can't wait to get older. And, and I used to look forward to the day when I would get braces. This is odd, but I, I, I view those kids who are older, about 12, oh, they have braces. They look so cool. But then you reach that stage and you get braces and you're like, this isn't very cool. But then you start to think, wait a second, once, well, once I drive, then, then that will be awesome. And, and you drive and it's great for a little while, but then you start to think, well, maybe the next season in life, once I go to college, then I'll ultimately be happy. And then once I get married and once I start a career and then well, well, once I have kids and then you feel the weight of all of that and then you're like, well, I'll be happy once I retire. You see, it's always then, 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 always looking forward, always going, I'll find contentment then. But the truth of the matter is, is tomorrow never comes. The final S is for sufferings. I need to explain to us that sometimes in life there are roadblocks to finding our purpose. Many times we falsely say that I can't find meaning, I can't have value because of this tragedy or trial that occurred in my life. That accident, that abuse, that misstep, that defines me. And I will never escape that that is my identity. Listen to me. Those trials, those hurts, those sufferings, they may help explain some of the struggles that you have, but that is not who you are. Who you are is in Christ. Amen. That you have been chosen, that you have been adopted, that you have been redeemed in Christ. So listen, I've taken the long way around this morning and I've, I've done that on purpose because I'm trying to prick your hearts along the way so that as we ask the question, your ears are now ready to hear this fourth blessing, all right? Because you are prime for purpose. So listen to me, what Paul says about this every spiritual blessing. I know that what he says here is theologically wordy, so let me say it to you as plainly as I can. Your story will find ultimate meaning and fulfillment, not in and of itself, but once you realize how you are a part of his story. Your story finds ultimate meaning when it's tied to his story. The purpose that you so desire is found up in God saying, my entire plan for all of history is the summing up of all things in Jesus Christ. That every person, every kingdom, every job, every plan ultimately converges at the feet of Christ bow down before him with the declaration that he is king, he is Lord, that all of history is his story. Everything is from him and through him and to him. You see, it's his creation. And he is sustaining all of it right now. And it's his eternal plan that everything is moving to the feet of Christ. So listen, believer, you and I are invited to move beyond our identity just in the death and resurrection of Jesus, to move beyond that and to look and to see where Christ is right now. This is the way the end of chapter one ends. It says, look and see Christ on his throne, seated at the Father's right hand. And God has promised that 
all authority, that all kingdoms, that every, every dominion, whether in the heaven or on earth, will ultimately be laid at the feet of Christ, that all enemies, including death itself, will be laid at the feet of Christ, that everything is moving towards that end, that his gospel will go to the ends of the earth, that the whole earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, that one day the sky will split and he will come back and he will judge the living and the dead, that every knee will bow, that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, that all things converge at his feet. Listen to me. When you see that, guys, this is the fourth spiritual blessing that you as a believer, God has opened your eyes to see that. And when you see that movement, you are able to find your own personal fulfillment in Christ, in his story. And here's the awesome part. Your story finds ultimate meaning in his story. You see, everything you've been looking for It's been in all the wrong places. It's temporary. It vanishes. You hold on to it for a second. You think it's going to last. It's going to last. Oh, that new watch is so good. Oh, those new shoes are so good. But eventually everything just fades. Everything fades. But in him, in his story, when you surrender to his story, making it ultimate, Whenever you start praying, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. When you see that, when you say, I want my whole life to be about you, suddenly this magnificent thing occurs in your life and that is that your story gets attached to him and you find the ultimate meaning that you've always longed for. That my story about leaving engineering to come and serve the church That's his story. And that your story as a businessman who serves in the youth department, that's his story. Or your story about a stay-at-home mom who homeschools the kids and and then prays for missionaries and writes encouraging cards to them. That's his story. Once you see that, once you see this truth that everything All plans, all walks of life converge at the feet of Christ. And that anything that you can do now ultimately has value because it will be a crown that you take off and you lay at the feet of Jesus that that gives your story ultimate value. Listen to me. There's freedom on the other side. There's a joy that is lasting, that finally quenches the thirst of your heart that you have longed for for so long. And it gives you a freedom to not chase after the purposes of the world. Listen, listen to what happens to items, your material possessions, they don't define you. Paul says, I've I've learned the secret of having a little or having a lot. I've learned how to be content in Christ. I can do all things through Christ. Furthermore, your material possessions, because you see the kingdom, you are now freely able to spend them on Christ's kingdom. You can invest in eternity. What happens to your duties, the things that you are good at? Well, listen, your work, you can now work without sacrificing your priorities. Because having our name on the side of a building is no longer the purpose. And you can let go through the transitions of life because seasons of life change. But if your purpose 
is ultimately where Jesus is, you can let go and you can transition. What about others? Now that Christ fills you, no longer, you are now able to overflow and to serve and to give to others, no longer being one who suffocates, no longer being one who drains on that relationship. Guys, this is how marriage works. Christ fills you, you overflow to your spouse. When Christ says, husbands, you are to love your wives the way that Christ does the church, you will say, I can't do that. I know, but Christ fills you and you overflow to others. What about the longings that we have? We don't have to wait until the next season of life to be content. We can be content now realizing that God is writing our stories. And what about our sufferings? Here's, here's the deal. We realize that nothing is wasted in God's economy, that he has promised that every trial, that every temptation is ultimately to make us more into the image of Christ and that those trials do not define us. Rather, Christ does. And he's promised to work all things for good, even those deep rooted, deep hurts, they do not define you anymore. So when you realize that everything, every job, every plan, every item, the way that you use every resource, everything in all of life, you lay down at the foot of the cross, or at the feet of Christ, that everything is converging to the throne of Christ. It gives you meaning. Meaning that you've always longed for. Talk about purpose, guys. Talk about purpose that all the purpose of the kingdom of God is now mine. That my story fits into his. Paul says, whatever suffering I go through, it gets added on to the suffering of Christ and tells the stories of what Christians are like. So let me ask you, do you know your kingdom purpose? Do you know how God has gifted you do you see how your story fits into God's kingdom? I've thrown a lot at you this morning. It's always like drinking from a fire hose, but probably especially this morning. But I want to leave here with some basics, some easy handles for you to hold on to as we think about our purpose in life. There is, there is a process of maturity to be able to see these every spiritual blessings, the way that they work out in your life a process of maturity. The first thing, as you first become a believer, right, is that you would begin to pray and worship and study your Bible, okay? That you would learn to feed yourself, establishing a daily relationship and walk with Jesus. Learn your identity and your purpose in him. Okay, as I go through these, think about where you are on the way. Can you feed yourself? Now, you never move on from these steps. You just implement more. The second aspect of growth is that you get connected to a small group. Around here, we call those growth groups. It's the truth of realizing that there is no such thing as a Lone Ranger Christian, but that, that God has called you for relationship to get connected with a group of people that walk through life with you, that hold you accountable, that can pray for you when the times get tough and can call you out when you are doing some of the things you shouldn't be doing. Guys, that only happens in those small groups, in that accountability. That your purpose is not found in you and God alone, but rather, as we walk through the rest of the book of Ephesians, we will find that our purpose is found collectively as a church in who we are. Not all fall by yourself, but together. Now, the third step of maturing is that you begin to discern your own spiritual gifts that God has made you with natural abilities and passions and spiritual gifts. That God has wired you 
for a specific job in how we function together as a body. Guys, I'm a glorified stomach. That's my job. I'm a glorified stomach. I chew on the word of God and then I dispense nutrients to the rest of the body. Are you an elbow who's desperately trying to be a hand because you think, oh, the hands, that's where it's at? Do you know how you fit into the body? The spiritual giftings and passions and ability that God has given you. Because when you see that, you start to see how your life fits into his story. And then fourthly, do you spend your resources for kingdom advancement? Your resources, your time, your energy, your talent, your money. Because you see, this is what I have that's ultimately of value. This is what I have that ultimately goes into and towards the kingdom of God. Always follow the money. I don't care what they say. They'll put their money, what they really value. That's why I brag on us as a church. You can follow the money in regards to what we give to to missions and and the way that we give to our local and international missions partners. Follow the money. Look at your own bank accounts. What you value, you will spend your money on. Are you consistent? Are you generous in your giving because you see how your life fits into God's ultimate plan? These are basic handles in your understanding of purpose. There's a maturing that happens as you walk because you begin to see how your life fits, how it works in God's story. That's on the mountaintop and that's in the valley. That's on sunny days and that's on dreary days. As you walk through life, there's this maturing that takes place. Earlier this, uh, or earlier last week, I got invited to go to the FCA breakfast and got to go with the legendary Stan Leach and got to be at his table. Now, Stan, if you don't know, he received an incredible award and honor just last week, and that was the fact that uh, he was nominated as a top 20 UIL coach of all time. All right, and so praise God for our uh, Stan Leach here in Bernie, longtime basketball coach. But I got to go to an FCA breakfast with him and while we were at that breakfast, they were uh, honoring um, the, the owner and founder of uh, Las Palatas, uh, Ron Acosta, for a lifetime war- award of generous living, okay? Specifically towards FCA. Now, as he's walking up there, right, I'm thinking to myself, here's a businessman whose story in the world's eyes is all about selling tacos. And yet, he loves Jesus. And he loves the way that FCA is able to meet students where they are in the middle of sports and share the good news of Jesus. So I think, all right, he's got my attention. And as he goes up there and he has a conversation with them, He shares this story, and I'll share it with you. Ron uh, grew up going and attending the high school in East L.A. where they did the the movie Stand and Deliver. It's called Garfield High School. It's in the uh, lower income portion of East L.A. And they called him one day because the football team had mismatched uniforms. It had been a long time and they were just scraping the bottom of the barrel, just piecing together whatever they could. And so they call him and they say, Ron, you're a distinguished alumni. Would it be possible? Could you buy us some new uniforms? Well, always generous, he said yes. Now, in that football season, the first three games of the season, they had lost miserably. They had gotten blown out just out of the water, not even close in those first three games. But between the third and the fourth game, the new uniforms came in. 
They went undefeated the rest of the season. They made a deep playoff run. Now, Ron got a lot of attention for this and so asked to come back and to talk to people and to stand before them, to which his simple reply was this. Guys, I'm just honored as a Christian to be able to serve you in any way that I could. But you need to hear this. All glory goes to Jesus. I heard that and I thought, that's purpose. That's purpose. When you can see the way selling tacos fits in to the story of Jesus Christ, how all roads converge at the feet of Christ. Guys, I long for that for every single one of you. And that's what scripture says here. If you can see this, This is your every spiritual blessing. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We pray right now in Jesus' name that all across this room, that we as Christians, as your sons and daughters, would be able to see the end. Because when we can see the end, we're able to realize our part in that. God, give us purpose. Give us eyes to see. Help us all across this room realize how you want to use us, how you have gifted us, and how we can spend our lives for you. Jesus, I want to spend my life on you because you are worthy. You are worthy of every sacrifice, of every thought, of every good work I could ever do. All to be laid at your feet And to say to you, my Lord and my King, you are worthy. You are so worthy. Give us that passion as a people, as a church. Fill us with purpose. Don't let us get distracted, distracted by all the things of the world. Forgive us, God, when we are, because you certainly are worthy. We pray all of that in Jesus' name, amen.